What's going on, Packers fans? Aaron Negler here, joined by Cody Alexander of Match Quarters, your one-stop shop for all things when it comes to the defensive side of the ball in the game of football. Cody, how are you today, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, you are slowly but surely going through your previews for all 32 NFL teams, and you finally got to the Packers. I've been waiting. I've been I've been reading all the others, but I've been waiting on the uh, Packers preview. Um, obviously, a couple months ago, we did a very initial look at the Packers defense after the draft, who guys, you know, might, which guys might fit where, et cetera. Right. But now that we've had an off season and we've had some reports from camp and how guys might fit certain places, I did want to go through uh, your piece, which people can find. Uh, there's a link in the description of this video over at match quarters, kind of looking at the defense position by position, front to back. Um, and before we do that, I do want to kind of point out, you have your own metric that you've formed yeah. and are starting to utilize throughout a lot of your analysis. Can you tell people what that is and what it's about? Yeah, so I'm actually working with, I'm, I'm on the board of what's called uh, Field Vision Sports. So we're, we're a predictive analytics platform. Uh, and so we're using like machine learning to do things like that. One of the things that I was kind of tasked with is we wanted to come up with a proprietary metric that essentially actually rates the players against you. Like how much production are they getting? Now we have what's called a simple havoc rate, which is just taking, you know, generic stats and then kind of dividing them by the amount of plays. And so it's like how many, how much plays. So what I've tried to do, it's really kind of make it more biased towards the scheme that the player's actually in adding more of a diversity. So if you can do good things in a diversity of coverages, so let's say um, I'm really good in zone and I'm really good in man, you're going to have a higher grade. Also, it kind of filters out uh, a lot of the minimum plays and things like you don't want to have a guy that, you know, has really good production, but he only played like five plays. <laughs> he right? played a so, handful of snaps, right? right? Right. So what I really wanted to do was be able to create something that we could evaluate players against each other but make it more apples to apples but also be able to then take that in the off season and project forward into player evaluation so why are we signing this player why did my team sign this guy instead of going after this guy um, and so for me it was more or less one of those things that I've, I've always wanted to do this and so being part of field vision and starting to do that now I was able to do that and I'm using these kind of as a way to uh, talk through the the rosters uh, in the NFL. And it was interesting reading your piece. Um, we'll start up front, obviously, with the defensive line, the interior out to the, you know, uh, pass rushers. But, you know, you're starting with Kenny Clark. And it's interesting to talk about Kenny because he's a player who I think most people will agree is one of the better players in the league. Certainly been manning the interior of the Packers defense for quite some time. Uh, but there are stretches where you can point to like almost, you know, a few games at a time pretty much every year where it's not like going to say he disappears, but to your, to use your term, he, his production is very inconsistent. Right. And I do wonder how much this scheme shift will help him, Devonte Wyatt, all the guys up front, because they're going to be asked to get upfield and create a little bit more havoc rather than two gapping read and reacting. How do you view this Packers defensive line? Yeah, I actually think collectively, I think what's going to end up looking at it is if our front line can stay healthy and we can get production out of our four top guys, we're going to be fine. We're going to be one of the better defenses, at least defensive line production wise. If you look at him, I said it in the article, like if you look at him on paper, you are kind of baffled as to why. They were having so much. Why are we having difficulty yeah. creating a pass rush? Why are we having difficulty stopping the run? And I think a lot of it has to, it goes back to these player evaluations, right? Of like, you have guys that are really good at, if you have a guy that's really good at pass rush, that means he's really good at like shooting the gap. Right. Uh, right. And so, when you do interior, that, right. right. And so, what people don't necessarily understand is like with this two gap or gap and half technique, that you, I mean, you're banging heads like that. You're literally trying to hold the guy in front of you 
as long as possible. And so uh, defenses have used these more and more as we kind of have gotten into more of a zone centric style of play, just because it's easy. Like we want to stagnate the line, make the running back choose the hole, and then we're all going to fall back onto them. Uh, but I think when you have guys that have had success and it really, when you look at what Halfley is coming from, which is that Robert Sala, D'Amico Ryan's kind of tree of right. let's get in wide nines. Let's let the edges eat. Let's inside guys. We're going to shoot gaps. We're going to demand double teams. I, those kind of things. I feel like fits more of what the Packers personnel has than what they were asked to do. Kind of that gap and a half drop into coverage a few times, just things of that nature. When you look at the edge rushers, um, you mentioned, obviously, Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith, but they've also got Lucas Van Ness, who they spent a first-round yes. pick on last season. And now they're going to be asking these guys to have their hand in the dirt more often than not. You know, you mentioned the wide nine, getting out there and kind of cre creating pressure, squeezing the pocket, so to speak. Do you think that's an easy transition? I mean, I know Van Ness did a lot of that, actually, at Iowa, but I don't know about Preston and Rashawn. I mean, Rashawn... Again, he did a lot of that in college, but that was a while ago. How tough do you think that's going to be for them, and how long do you think it's going to be into the season for them to be comfortable in those roles? Yeah, a lot of the stance for if you talk to defensive line coaches, the really the big difference between a two-point stance and then a three-point stance is literally just picking that, that hand up. And so then it becomes more or less of kind of – it's more – at the point of attack against the run um, where you kind of see the difference of where if I'm standing up, I can see the backfield. Um, if I'm kind of down, I don't necessarily see the backfield as well. And so that to me is where the biggest difference comes in. It's more structurally what you're asked to do than necessarily technique wise, because I think technique wise, it's pretty much it's pretty much the same thing. You're just changing kind of width and then whether I have my hand down or not. It's interesting because I think Preston throughout his career has done a really good job holding the edge against the run. It's been an issue for Rashawn as far as letting guys out the back door and keeping trying to slide inside and then allowing big lanes to open up behind him while he does that. Switching to the four three or the four down lineman alignment and having their hands in the in the ground, et cetera. I'm fine with all that, but the moment you said wide nine, I got a little shiver up my back because all I could think of was the NFC Championship game a few years ago. And obviously they they were standing up in that game, but they were wide, right? And right. Shanahan took advantage of them over and over to the tune of 200 plus yards on the ground. What's the difference? I mean, I think for the layman, you see the Packers maybe lining up wide and leaving some of these big gaps there. You mentioned in your article, they've had major issues stopping the run. Yes. What could potentially or possibly change just because these guys have their hands in the dirt? Well, I think it really comes back to the inside. It's just shifting from a five-man front to more of a four down. So what you're going to end up getting is you're going to get less zone and you're going to get more gap scheme. Like primarily, if you look at what, how teams attack the jets and the Texans and the 49ers have, it has been with a lot of trap plays, um, yes. you know, or those mid zone where we're going to press the edge, and then we're going to cut back. And so really it comes down to linebacker play. I think Quay Walker is going to have to really uh, kind of develop. And then also what did they do in the, the draft? They went and got two different linebackers. So I think, it's just if you read the roadmap in front of you, you can kind of see where they're trying to bolster that the interior of the of the line, you know, the linebacker spot. But then they're also going to be asking those interior guys is you've got to get penetration. You've got to produce up front or you got to demand the double team so that we can keep that second level clean. Yeah. And I, you mentioned Quay Walker and we'll go to the linebacker spot there because, you, you know, as you say, they drafted Edrin Cooper and they're certainly running him with the ones already throughout the offseason. The surprise for me, I thought heading into the offseason when they made the hire of Halfley and we knew they were switching, I thought for sure Quay Walker was going to be your weak side backer. But so far, he's been in the middle and Edrin Cooper has been the one doing a lot of the weak side stuff which I guess makes sense given their physical makeups. How do you see Walker kind of fitting in as kind of the central piece of Halfley's 4-3 scheme? 
I think he's going to play the exact same role that he played at Georgia, which was I'm a blitzing backer. I'm an A-gap plugger. I can match up with the running back when you need me to. If you need me to walk down on the line on third down or even on some of these early downs and play as kind of an edge rusher, because I think that's the other thing is a lot of these teams now, you have to have some sort of a five-man alignment. If you go watch, I mean, go the Lions, speaking, staying within the division, like everybody Mm -hmm. played them from a 5-1 alignment. Just because of the way that their offense is structured, you want to have a nickel on there, but then you also want to be able to kind of spread those anchor points out. And so I think, to me, more and more teams, yes, they're a four down. I don't think they'll be as static as kind of the Jets and the 49ers and the and the, and the, the Texans, just because Halfley's right. had that college experience. And if you watch Boston College, they did run some different front structures. They had some different things they wanted to do against different opponents. He did have like a 3-3 kind of dime package that he ran out there every once in a while, especially like against Syracuse where you're getting a lot of these vertical stretching plays. But it does make sense to me, and I, and I think we talked about this again, and then when you really look at it, Cooper's going to be your money backer, meaning he's going to yeah. be the guy that goes to the tight end. He's going to be your quintessential 4-2, nickel, 4-3, Will linebacker who is going to yeah. shade the tight end. He's going to go away from the nickel in the patchy street. So that to me is – natural Walker was really good at Georgia in blitzing the interior. In fact, they flipped their defense to being more of a five man rush with Walker really being a lot of the times the penetrator from the second level and creating that and letting him go up against a guard and, and kind of or up against the center and being able to kind of you know get free. And so to me, that's where it looks like we're headed. Right. Uh, I think, you know, utilizing his athleticism in a way that, and I know there's been a lot made of this. Uh, Devondre Campbell on his way out the door has talked a lot about what they were, or were not asked to do. And it sure sounds like, you know, you, get, you read between the lines of some of the quotes from the locker room. It does feel like these guys are going to be asked to just play more and react more and get after it more rather than thinking so much about if then, like what's my assignment if this happens and then you're trying to react and it's all – kind of jammed up process wise in your head rather than, okay, this is my gig and this is what I do down in and down out. And this like, whatever the call is, I know my responsibility and I'm just going to go do it. I think that's going to help Quay Walker immensely. And yeah. I do think he, he should, if you're looking at the other defenses, the ones you're name checking here, whether you look at the jets, the 49ers obviously have some amazing inside yes. backers, but the Texans as well, you look at what they ask their backers to do. It's certainly something I think Quay, is more than capable of doing. You know, I don't think there's anything I see from any of those defenses where I'm thinking, oh, that's going to be way too much for him. Like I'll, I'll, the where I see the differences when you're comparing these defenses is up front. You know, you yeah. look at Bosa, obviously, um, but even in New York with the Jets, they have some amazing talent up front to control things and wreak havoc. That's where I think, to your point earlier, yeah, you're going to have to ask these guys up front to create havoc and keep Walker clean because if they can, yeah, I think he's going to eat. I don't think there's a doubt yeah. there. No, and I, I agree with you. Like because, And that's what I kind of said was like on paper, you have to feel really good. But because like – the history of what happened the past couple years, it's just like, okay, are what team's going to show up? Are we going to get the right. team that looks like a top 10 defense or are we going to get the team that uh, it looks like a bottom third? And that's kind of that thing of like consistency. And that is really, you know, you alluded to it. The modern defense today, that's kind of the, the line drawn in the sand. You have guys that want to keep it simple. They don't want to do a lot. They want their guys to be fast. But then you also have the other ones that are like, we're trying to formationally check. We're trying to play. We're trying to play defense like offenses are trying to play. And so we're going to match you intellectually that way, or we're just going to go quick. And I think if you can find uh, that, that nice medium spot, which I thought like Mike McDonald, who's now with the Seattle, I feel like right. – he kind of revamped the Raven system, started putting things into different buckets where we can be mo- the illusion of complexity, but really where our teaching processes are better. I just feel like that's kind of where you're getting. If you're going to be really simple, like the Jets and like the 49ers, you better right. be really, really good. The Browns gotta, are another great yeah, example. You got to own up front. You got to own up. Front yes. Because that's 100%. everything. You got to control it. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And it's funny because uh, to hear you talk like that, you talk about process and McDonald and what he did in Baltimore. 
I don't know if Hathaway is going to come in and do something similar, right? As far as being able to kind of really um, give them a different process as far as what they learn, right? But then how to react on the field, because that's where you talk about the last three years with Joe Barry, it just never felt like they had an answer on the field. Like yeah. if they, whatever the call was, like, especially situationally, whether it was third and short, whether it's uh, red zone, what have you, if that call wasn't right in quotes, right. If that call didn't match up really well initially from whatever the offense was going to try and do, they were lost. It was over. Like that's where I think if Hathley does nothing else, like forget the scheme, forget all that, but just gives the guys process on the field that they can take ownership of and go, Oh, I know what they're trying to do. We can switch to X, Y, Z, like, but right. make it quick, make it easy and make, let them still continue to just play. I don't, I have no idea if Hathley's capable of doing that. I don't know if he's going to do that, but to me, that's a glaring thing when you watch Green Bay's defense over the course of the last three years, where that's the best defenses are able to do that. We see what you're trying to do. We know what you're trying to take advantage of. We have a counter, but all in real time. Right. No, you're hundred percent correct. When you look at the cornerback group, I loved what you wrote about uh, Stokes and Alexander because you know, Stokes obviously did have a very promising rookie year and then has been pretty disappointing since now, obviously has dealt with a lot of injuries coming out of this off season. Sounds like he's right as rain and good to try and reclaim that spot. But then you look at Alexander, he's been an all pro, uh, certainly had an up and down year last year. I think after the suspension though, you really saw a guy who came to play. Now he was dealing with an ankle injury, but you don't have to look much further than that interception early in the Dallas game in the playoffs where that switches the whole game, right? The Packers right. take that and score a touchdown. They're up 14, nothing. That's the type of player he can be given like what you've seen and what you know of Hathley as a defensive backs coach, et cetera. I know Packers fans are very excited about the idea of these guys, maybe getting their hands on receivers a little bit more being a little bit more quote aggressive. I know it's not that simple, but what do you think and what do you expect from Green Bay's defensive backs, their cornerbacks in particular, under Halfley and what they're going to look like down in and down out. Yeah, so if you actually go by what did the Packers do really well last year, if you go by that, they actually had the eighth best uh, EPA in cover one. And what does Halfley want to do? Halfley wants to run cover one. I saw you wrote that. I can't imagine, like, all of a sudden we see a bunch of cover one. I'll, I, I'll gladly be proven wrong, but wow, that would be a, a pretty sizable shift. Yeah. Now, I will put an asterisk on that because we don't really know how much cover one they're going to run. I just know that if you, they ran probably the most cover one of any team in college football last year at about 43%. So what I think is you're going to get the similar uh, percentages as Joe Barry. It's just going to be a little, di it's going to be different, right? It's going to just be, there's di the difference is going to be the front structure, what's being asked to do up front. I don't think that we're going to see somewhere where like the Browns now and then now right. the commanders with Quinn and Witt that are just going to try and run 41% of the time. We just want to run man. Um, I do think you have man corners. I think you're going to maybe see more of it, even if it's something is like a, a 30, 30 or a, you know, you know, something or 35, 25, where we're running about 35% cover three, 25% cover one, mostly on third, you know, like third and, and and middle downs where we really want to get really tight. But if you look at what they were able to be really good at last year, they were terrible in cover three. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the kind of like the system that it was. It was just more, a lot of fire zones, which is a lot of holes in the, in the, in the coverage, more of a, you can still run spot drop, but if you're not getting, a consistent pass rush, you're essentially just playing like you would like a country cover four. I mean, you don't want to just run right. just country cover three and not get a pass. You're going to look like what the Rams did like two years ago when they were just like, everybody was getting yak on them. Right. <laughs> so I do think the two corners, I think if you simplify some things with Stokes, give him some things early to do, get, get that going. I, because I mean, he is going to be, and I mentioned this in there, he's going to be playing for his contract. I mean, this is a guy that was yeah. a first round draft pick. They didn't pick up his fifth year option. He hasn't really played to be honest with you in the last three years consistently. Alexander, you know, he's got to answer. Have I fallen off the cliff? 
yeah, I can play really good in a one-off game in the playoffs, but can I do it consistently over some of the behavior that he had last year? Can I have I been able to kind of clean that up? And I just think just from – and I am completely outside. I do – I've listened to you talk multiple times about Joe Barry and the defense, but it just seemed like it was a lot of just chaos – a lot of guys kind of just doing whatever they were, you know, trying to survive. And I think mm -hmm. there's always a little bit of a bump when you have something different, when you have a different process. And it's this is going to be a little bit more simplified. I think with a lot of issues with Barry, and I've, I've just heard this from several people, it's like trying to run a Fangio adjacent scheme, but not really knowing the Fangio stuff. And so you're trying to mix it. We saw what that looked like with Vance Joseph, which was just an, an absolute nightmare as somebody who's a Broncos fan. Uh, <laughs> it was just a nightmare. Uh, oh, so, yeah. but when he shifted away from it and went to a more, simple which he did product, well, yes, I thought that was the surprise of the season to me. Oh, 100%. Like, the beginning of the season, it was like, oh, well, everyone's going to score 100 on these guys. And then yes. he really he did a really nice job adjusting and they, they, in the season. Shifted some guys around in the secondary. So I do think, I do think like for the Packers, and there is a precedent for, okay, we're going to play a little bit more man coverage. That's what we're good at. Let's play a little bit more of it than we've had. Maybe play a little bit more match cover three and not necessarily a lot of just zone where we're kind of just watching uh, the ball, uh, more being able to relate to the guys that were around. Maybe that will kind of clean up some things. That's where I see at least at corner. That's where I feel like if they can lean into a little bit more of the match principles, maybe we can we can kind of cook there. Well, in the idea of actually matching up with wide receivers and having some route recognition, getting what they're trying to do to you in real time again, um, and just ultimately landing on a spot where you have defensive backs, cornerbacks in a position to make a play on the ball. Right. I mean, I think the Packers were, if not dead last, like near the bottom of the league as far as pass passes broken up right like they were never around the intended receiver um something that i think will help them in that regard obviously getting a, a few more guys up front allowed to get on those wide receivers etc but the safety position is going to be fascinating to me because you wrote you wrote about mckinney and bullard um and in your eyes that's going to be your starting safety combo i think signs are pointing in that direction obviously the packers don't hand out the starting job in the offseason. right yeah but I do agree with you. I think Bullard is your guy, right? Opposite McKinney. It's going to be fun to watch how much each of them takes turns playing that post spot and playing down near the line of scrimmage. Because I do think you can ask both of them to do both. And I think yes. you ultimately have to, right? Because otherwise, if you're an offensive coordinator, it makes it real easy. You get a couple games into the season and, oh, I know exactly what they're trying to do because this guy does this, this guy does that, and we're off to the races. I think a big part of this is going to be predicated on making sure both of those safety spots are pretty interchangeable on tape. And I think that's modern defense. I think that now more and more we're getting to left, right safety structures. Um, you obviously have guys that are better at doing one thing. And so on early downs, maybe you see uh, McKinney down there a little bit more. I think now what you have with having two guys that can play in the slot really well, uh, McKinney played. I, I think that's the other thing. Like people probably don't realize, but he played enough snaps because of how close post the heavy the Giants were under Martindale, he played enough down that like he actually rates as like one of the better slot defenders in the NFL. So you have a guy that can play down and can play back. And now you have, you can pair him with another guy that can play down and play back. And even the, the backup, the kid from Oregon, who's probably, I think, oh, will challenge. Love him. Yes. Yeah. He can play. So if you really go and look, and that's what we talked about when initially after the draft was like, if you really go and look at the plan, there's a plan in place to be able to play some too high structures, to be able to move guys around so that we're not constantly. I think like that's the biggest thing, thing from like a team like the Cowboys, who you know who's going to be down. You know who's going to be back. They can switch it up a little bit, but you have that predictability. You know exactly what you're going to get, and then they just feel like, look, we're just better. We're going to beat you. Whereas, like, I think more and more teams are realizing if we can have a lot of these interchangeable parts, 
we can then kind of match guys up. Hey, he really matches up with this tight end better this week than maybe, hey, we're playing more of like, hey, we're playing the Jaguars. Ingram's basically a receiver. Like, let's match up. You know, maybe we'll put Bowler down there who's more of a slot type guy. Like, so you get guys like to me, it just opens the door for more multi again it looks complex to the offense it's another package that the offense has to now kind of explore and then prepare for but then for you the complexity is just not there on defense because it's just you're moving a guy yeah right you're just matching i mean more and more in the nfl right it is about matchups and it's about trying to find them and exploit them oh man i could talk ball with you all day i love it every time you come on cannot thank you enough cody um Uh, Like I said, if you want to read Cody's piece, not only on the Packers, but previewing all of the NFL defenses, make sure you do so. Go to Match Quarters, subscribe to his newsletter. It's really great stuff. Cody, thank you so much, man. Yeah, appreciate you having me on. Thank you.